I think it's uh, five past, so we can start. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to the Flash Talks, Quantum Information Flash Talks by our Quantum Information Society, where it's, this is the first event in uh, Hillary term. In my opinion, we have quite dense uh, term on coming because like we have quite a lot of events. Some time of them are maybe for more proficient guys, but some of them will be uh, accessible for uh, less, uh, how to say this, uh, less experienced pub, uh, audience. And today, are the, as I already said, the aim of our today's event is to deliver the what happens in Oxford, in general, like what happens in world science, but this um, issue is kind of devoted to the Oxford science. We have uh, 3D field students and they'll tell you what, what is, Research, what their research is about. So, uh, first one is Cameron, based on what we post on posted on Facebook. And yeah, she, that's cool. I can I can start up. Let me just uh, do the the Zoom stuff. Yep. Right. Can you see my screen? I can. Can you see it? Yeah. No, yeah. I keep pressing the wrong thing. No, no, but I was uh, able to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I then closed it. Um, right. Okay. Let's not be an amateur about this. Yeah, now it's okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, great. Uh, I'll just get going. Let me just start a timer so I don't go miles over. Um, so, yeah. Hi. Evening, everyone. Um, I'm Cameron, as has been said. I'm a PhD student here at Oxford. And I'm researching the dynamics of out of equilibrium quantum mechanical systems, primarily many body systems. Um, as a bit of, of uh, background, despite being in the physics department, I'm actually a mathematician. Um, I just got a bit lost when I came to Oxford. So my research is pretty theoretical. Uh, that being said, given that this is aimed at a pretty wide audience, I'm hoping to uh, make it as accessible as possible. And as a result, I'm only actually going to use two equations in my whole talk, which is, is quite impressive for me. Okay. Uh, a quick summary of my talk. Uh, my plan is to recap some basic quantum mechanics, just so anyone who's, uh, who, just to bring us all to the same level um, and, and start on the same page. Uh, I'm then gonna turn to many body dynamics, explain why this is so difficult. You'll hear me refer to the curse of dimensionality. Uh, and I'll then explain how we can, how we can tame these systems uh, using symmetries. I'll also throw in a little bit of quantum computing in here and about how many body systems can, can play a role for that. For the second half of my talk, I'm going to switch to out of equilibrium quantum mechanics. Here we'll need the Lindblad equations. So that's one of the two equations we'll see today. Uh, and we'll see that these problems are even harder than they were before, hence why I've, I've squared the curse of dimensionality. That'll become clear later. And I'll finish off discussing my actual research, which is time crystals and synchronization, um, which arises as a consequence of symmetries. As I said, I'm going to gloss over a lot of the details. Um, if anything doesn't make sense, uh, stick a question in the chat or, or the other guys can stop me. And I'm more than happy to chat through details at the end. Okay, with that underway, let's have a quick recap of quantum mechanics. This will hopefully be useful for everyone. Um, and while I'm sure many of you are familiar, I just want to get us all on the same page. For the purposes of my talk, there are three ingredients we need for quantum mechanics. The first is the state, which is basically just a vector. Uh, and it describes everything about the system um, at a given time. So its position, velocity, everything is described by this, this vector. Uh, the second ingredient is the Hamiltonian, uh, which is a Hermitian matrix. And this matrix describes how the energy of our system depends on the state. So that's, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, the dimensions of these vectors and matrices uh, are determined by the number of energy levels of the system. This is where the, the word quantum comes from in quantum mechanics is because our, our energy levels are quantized and can only take finite values, finitely many values. Um, the simplest example um, is a stationary electron, which can have a spin in some direction. Uh, so we describe the state of the system uh, using two states, which is spin up or spin down, um, or any linear superposition of those, because in, we can take linear superpositions of vectors. Uh, the Hamiltonian is then some Hermitian two by two matrix, which I've just written here as ABA, uh, ABBBA. Uh, and that, that can be any Hermitian matrix. The third part we need is the Schrodinger equation. And this tells us how our, how our state evolves in time. So we take some psi naught, we solve the Schrodinger equation, and we find the state at some later time. Uh, this is a matrix differential equation. We've got vectors and we've got matrices. Uh, so we solve it by diagonalizing. Uh, so we find the energy levels of the Hamiltonian, and we find the corresponding energy eigenstates. 
This means that all the information we need about how the system behaves is contained completely in the Hamiltonian, and more specifically, its eigenvalues and eigenstates. Uh, another important char characteristic of the system, uh, which is described somewhat by the Hamiltonian, are the symmetries of the system. For our purposes today, a symmetry is just something that's conserved. Uh, so it doesn't change as the system evolves. This could be something like the number of particles, the angular momentum, the charge, those sorts of things. In general, we can't find the symmetries in a formulaic manner like we can with the eigenvalues and eigenstates. There's no sort of prescribed procedure. And we often have to work quite hard and look really carefully at the structure of the Hamiltonian and any underlying geometry uh, to work out what they are. But once we find them, they're really, really helpful for constraining the problem and reducing the number of degrees of freedom that the, the system can evolve uh, with. As a brief aside, um, the picture on the screen is completely unrelated to today's talk. It's just a pretty picture. Uh, it shows the 2D projection of a special eight dimensional lattice called E8, um, which corresponds to the root lattice of an E8 group. For those of you who understand technical stuff, that might mean something. Otherwise, it's just cool maths and a story for another day. So back to some quantum mechanics. Um, and you might now ask what the catch is. Uh, in my simplified picture of quantum mechanics, we only have three things. And all we basically have to do is diagonalize the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian matrix. Uh, although this can be quite painful to do by hand, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, it's pretty easy to do on a computer, especially modern supercomputers. They're designed almost specifically for it. Unfortunately, in physics, we're rarely interested in the behavior of a single particle. And in fact, if we want to tie the quantum world of say one or two particles with the classical world around us, we have to start solving quantum mechanical systems uh, with two to the 26 particles or, or more. And that's a lot of particles. Um, and this is where the curse of dimensionality kicks in because uh, in quantum mechanics, the number of possible energy levels of this dimension of the matrices and vectors that we were talking about grows exponentially with the number of particles. Um, so for example, uh, if we take a, a, a spin half particle, uh, and there's just one of them, the, the total system has dimension two. If we take two particles, the system has dimension four. If we take three, we get eight, four, we get 16, etc. cetera. Um, but in fact, as this, as this table shows, once we get to 10 to the 26 particles, the number's too big and we don't even know what two to the power of 10 to the 26 is. I think Wolfram Alpha managed to give me like the last five digits of it or something. Um, so to give you an idea of how many calculations we can do, my laptop can manage about 20 particles. Uh, the university supercomputer can manage about 100 particles if you're willing to wait a few weeks and make some clever approximations. Uh, but 100 particles is still an awful lot, awfully lot short of 10 to the 26 particles. Uh, a quick remark, especially for this audience interested in quantum computing, the curse of dimensionality is not always a curse. Um, and in fact, it's fundamentally related to quantum entanglement, which is the foundation of uh, quantum technologies. In fact, it's this very reason that quantum computers have the potential to perform calculations that are classically impossible uh, because the entanglement allows the computation to be done in parallel. Because the information is encoded in this highly entangled state though, it's often very difficult to extract any useful information for it, uh, from it. But I'll leave that to, to Lewis, who I'm sure we'll discuss it further. So there are several ways to overcome the curse of dimensionality. Um, there's an awful lot of people, um, both in physics and, and elsewhere, trying to devise better computational methods, better techniques, better computers. Some other people work with clever approximations. So you can maybe, do perturbative work or, or other sorts of approximations. But my approach uh, is to study systems with symmetries and see how these symmetries or lack of symmetries can tell us what's going on. One particular symmetry in extended systems, so, so big, big lattices say, uh, that's particularly useful is what's called a strictly local symmetry, which as the name suggests means that something is conserved in a, in a local region of space. Um, and to demonstrate this briefly, I want to have a quick go at explaining Kitayev's honeycomb model. So this model consists of particles living on vertices of a, of a hexagonal lattice, which are allowed to hop around and, and interact with each other. I won't go through the details, but the important bit is that there's a strictly local symmetry on each hexagon, which means that each hexagon can either take the value plus one or minus one. And because these values are fixed, they're symmetries, we can treat them as, as sort of quasi particles that live on the lattice. Um, and we call the, if it's got a minus one, we call it a vortex. If we call it plus one, we just call it the background. Uh, so these minus ones are, are vortices that can, that can move around. 
and the real interest, the real interest of these vortices is that they can act as quasi particles called anions. Um, and these particles, these are particles that when you swap them around, don't give you back the same state. Um, so to demonstrate what what I mean, let's take a pair of two pairs of vortices uh, and braid one vortex around the other. So we sort of move it around. Do, 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 do. But then when we get back to the same configuration, the overall quantum state has picked up a phase. Um, and it's so the state knows that these vortices have moved around one another. Um, and that's really useful. Uh, these anions uh, are the foundation of what are called topological quantum computers. Um, and these braids that you, you can construct and these knots store quantum information. Uh, it's a really interesting area of research, but it would take a whole lecture course to do any justice. Um, and I certainly am not the one to give it. So I'll leave it there for now. And moved swiftly on to some out of equilibrium quantum mechanics. Um, in everything we've discussed so far, our quantum systems have been perfectly isolated from the environment. Um, so the only thing that can influence the evolution is the Hamiltonian. In the real world, any of you who have done any sort of experiment, um, even just dropping something, uh, know that experiments are never perfectly isolated from the environment. And the consequence of this is that we need to be able to understand how our environment influences our system. Here's your second equation after the Schrodinger equation for the day. Uh, this is the Lindblad equation and describes how the environment can affect our, our system. Uh, it looks a bit complicated, uh, and anyone who knows the technical details, it's also missing an H-bar, uh, but it can be straightforwardly understood. So the bits with the H uh, is just the Schrodinger equation written in a, in a slightly odd way. It's the second part that describes the environment, and so these L mu operators, uh, which again are just matrices like they were before, are describe how the, how the environment interacts with the system, so they can be uh, particle creation or annihilation operators, say, for, uh, for the system gaining or losing particles. The details are unimportant for now, so I'm just going to write it as a super operator, this script L, which we call the Lubillian. Um, you might be unfamiliar with this double ket. It's just a state vector. It's exactly the same as it was before, except that because we're dealing with an environment, we have to worry about what's called decoherence. And this is where the quantum state starts to become more classical. And to describe it properly, we have to work with density operator states. What this basically does is to square the, si the length of the vector. So if it's got a single ket, it's got its original size. If it's got a double ket, it's got a squared length size. Um, so we now need to use vectors and matrices of dimension n squared for a system of dimension n. This is where the curse of dimensionality comes again, but this time it's squared because we now want to solve the equation in exactly the same way that we solve any uh, linear matrix differential equation. We have to uh, diagonalize the, the operator. So in this case, the Louvillian. But we now see that if we look back at our table from earlier, we see how, it, how the system's got so much worse. Just 10 particles requires a vector of over 100,000 elements. Um, so generally, we've now halved the, the number of particles that we can actually talk about. Um, so this is th this makes it even worse. But our savior uh, is the symmetries of the system. So we can use symmetries to reduce the complexity and understand what's going on. In fact, there are two different types of symmetries called strong and weak symmetries that we can find in the Lindblad equation, basically depending on whether the symmetry is of the underlying system or of the sort of combined system and environment. But details. Uh, we also have these things called dynamical symmetries which are particularly important for the dynamics of the system and how, how things evolve. So these dynamical symmetries can be used to understand two very interesting phenomena. One is quantum synchronization, and the second is dissipative time crystals. So quantum synchronization is almost what it says on the tin. It's the process by which separate parts of a quantum system can synchronize and oscillate with the same amplitude and phase. Um, so for example, if we have two interacting particles, this could be that their spins align and start moving together. And I've just draw, drawn a diagram of, of two things oscillating together. Dissipative time crystals are a bit, are a bit weirder. Um, this is where the environment induces oscillatory motion in a quantum system. Strictly speaking, they only exist when you have infinitely many particles, uh, but we can see their effects in, in small systems. What happens is that you take some system that evolves almost chaotically or noisily at least, 
And then when it interacts with the environment, it starts to become nice and periodic. Um, this is extremely counterintuitive. We usually think of the environment as something that sort of screws up our system or, or, or makes it behave in a really weird way. But here we have exactly the opposite. Okay, so I'm now gonna just show you some pretty pictures. Um, they're gonna be moving pretty pictures. I'm, I'm very impressed with this. Uh, one example of when both of these phenomena can occur um, and they're a result of these strong dynamical symmetries that I mentioned uh, is when we have some electrons living on a line. So we say, we say they're all in a 1D line, they can hop in along and they, they obviously repel each other, they're electrons. Um, and if we just start the system in some completely random state and let it evolve, then this is what happens. So each of the line shows a different site, but basically it's a bit random. Um, and it's, it's rather, rather confusing, not really sure what's going on. However, what we can then consider doing is we can allow the environment to interact on our system in a very specific way. It allows the system to gain electrons and lose electrons, but only in pairs. So you've got to have a spin up and a spin down particle go in or a spin up and a spin down particle come out. If this happens, then we see that very quickly, the spins all synchronize and become perfectly oscillatory. So this is the, the different sides. Um, and this is exactly what we mean by both quantum synchronization and dissipative time crystals. And the reason that they both occur in this system is because they're both so closely related to strong dynamical symmetries. Okay, let's finish up. I hope that's given you a, a whirlwind overview of many body out of equilibrium quantum mechanics. Uh, it's a vast subject and is of huge interest for taming quantum mechanical systems that are useful for developing technologies. Uh, that's what we're really going for with the end goal of all this sorts of research. I introduced you to the curse of dimensionality um, and explained that the computations of many body systems are basically impossible if you want to do anything more than about 100 particles. I then showed you the honeycomb model, which is made possible by strictly local symmetries. In the second half, I whistled through the Limblad equation uh, that we use to describe out of equilibrium quantum mechanics. And I showed you my work on quantum synchronization and dissipative time crystals, which are both a consequence of, of symmetries. And with that, I think I should just be within time, maybe. Perfect timing, yeah, absolutely. Oh, ideal. Are there any questions? Yes. Well, uh, so we had one question in the chat already. Uh, you, I think you can see it by Darren. Uh, and... I can't see the chat right now, let me. Where with my sh screen shared, I can't. Ah, there we go. There's the chat. Uh, Louisville Repres representation of state and comp basis. It, do it doesn't matter what the basis is for the Louisvillian. Oh, Lewis, you could have asked this <laughs> in a voice. But yeah, yeah. Thanks, Lewis. You, you, I'll just I'll just respond straight. What physical processes can can add pairs of electrons to a system? Um, well, any system that is conserving spin or conserving angular momentum would have to introduce and lose uh, electrons in pairs because if you if you just gained a single electron, you're going to uh, you're going to change the spin uh, of the system. So there that's there are quite a few systems that would do that. Oh, well, any example? Uh, so the, the exact model that, that that system is for is would have to be engineered in a in a uh, quantum optics setup mm -hmm. with with cold with cold atoms, and th at that point you could engineer a system with with a specific bath that would allow it would allow the environment to act like this. Okay, yeah, sure, but I actually like to be fair, like um, all the audience, you have like a Q and A uh, session for questions and not chat, for example. Yeah, so it'd be great if you post your questions there. Mm. We had just had a comment by Tyson Jones. Thank you very much, Tyson. Um, Oh yeah, we got one. We got two. Jesus Christ! Ah, oh, next. Oh, now I found the Q and A. I'm I'm getting used to. It. Uh, could you tell us what the axes for the dissipative time plus crystal plot were? Yes, they were uh, time, obviously, as it was moving, and it was the um, uh, it was time, and it was the spin in the x direction on each side. Uh, so the transverse spin. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's the dissipative and dissipative time crystals mean? S uh, in 
we use the language dissipative quite broadly for basically anything that's interacting with an environment and therefore doesn't have a conserved total energy. Um, indeed, if you if you computed the energy for these things, uh, the energy wouldn't be conserved. Is there a so then? Oh, I guess you can all see these questions. Is there a considerable entropy cost to this coherence process? It seems like the environment is sorting out the system. What do we expect uh, the effects on the environment to be? So, the model that we use, the Limblad equation, is uh, doesn't think about the the environment as as having any sort of entropy or anything. It's an infinite bath, so it it can't. It, it's it is always in equilibrium with itself. It's just out of equilibrium with the with the system. In terms of the entropy of the of the distance time crystals, uh, it does increase initially, I think, and then and then decreases over time. I can't remember whether it decreases to a to a constant time or anything. Uh, ah, hundred particles is the standard limit. What's the limit with symmetries? So, I mean, if you're clever with your symmetries, the limit is infinite because, or if there is enough symmetries, then you can understand it analytically and solve it completely. These are these examples of these systems are called integrable. And so because they have so many symmetries, you can actually solve the systems completely. Um, in terms of computation, you can the symmetries can be used alongside the sort of approximation methods that I mentioned to basically reduce the size of the Hilbert space. And so it, it depends on the on how how strict the symmetries are. Um, but again, that can that can improve your computation. Um, it's not something I've done before personally, so I don't know the exact numbers of how many particles you could you could have. I think we exactly like had like five uh, minutes for questions, so I think we can uh, wrap it up here. I just wanted to uh, mention that on the last week of Hillary, we'll have an introduction to topological quantum computing, which uh, Cameron mentioned during his presentation. By, Who's giving uh, that? Uh, Jason Alicia from Caltech. And so, if you got interested, I got interested. Uh, yeah, you feel, feel free to join us. I think it should be great. Okay, thank you very much, Cameron. That was like a brilliant, like, like well rehearsed and like everything, like in time. We, I enjoyed it personally. So, and uh, the next speaker is then Luis. Awesome. Um, Luis yeah. He's also, yeah, a PhD at the same group as Cameron and the guys doing really cool stuff like with quantum computer. Well, yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, you should be able to see my screen now, I guess. Is that right? I do. I do. You got it? Yeah, I do see. Awesome. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a sort of a bit about the area that I work in, and this is on variational quantum algorithms. Um, for those of you that are completely unfamiliar, I hope that this will be a sort of introduction for many of you. I'll describe some applications, but then I hope to describe perhaps a, a few of the new, more nuanced points about how you design these and some more recent results that are coming out in the literature about it. So my, my somewhat labored structure for the, the talk is based on this sort of metaphor. Um, the first I'm going to be describing what I've described as the, the dizzying heights or the sort of peaks about variational quantum algorithms. And so this is gonna begin with a description of what they are and how they work and also why they might be uh, quite, a, well, uh, quite a promising candidate for useful applications in the near term. I'll then describe what some of these applications might be, and then also talk about what are the, the sort of key points that we want to engineer in our algorithms to be able to make them really powerful and work really well. Uh, the second half of my talk is uh, going to focus what I think are on uh, a sort of, yeah, uh, some more developing ideas in the field about some possible problems and issues that you can run into. And this is in particular this issue of barren plateaus, uh, like analogous to these geographical barren plateaus that you see here. Uh, which is why I've uh, based this whole talk around this somewhat awkward metaphor. Um, but yeah, I'm going to describe what these are, uh, how they come about, and also um, one possible solution to them that revolves around using uh, really yeah, knowledge about your problem that you're trying to solve in order to choose a circuit structure that you have in your algorithm. So to start off with, uh, I'll run quickly through what a variational algorithm is. I think it's, it's a fairly new type of algorithm. Uh, you don't see it at the moment in many textbooks, but I, I hope it's, uh, well, I hope I'll do a good job and it's fairly simple to understand here. So the aim of a variational quantum algorithm or a VQA is basically to solve or approximately solve some sort of optimization problem. 
and I'll get into what these can be, but basically you have to encode uh, your optimization problem within, I might have a pointer here, there we go, within a Hamiltonian, just like the Hamiltonian that Cameron spoke about, you in some way encode the cost function that you want to minimize in your optimization routine into a Hamiltonian that acts on quantum states. And then our algorithm works to try and find optimal values of these quantum states, psi, um, that minimize this Hamiltonian, and therefore lead to sort of a, a minimum of your cost function. So a variational quantum algorithm does this by using uh, what can be quite a short quantum circuit to prepare what are called variational states um, that are basically uh, tests for your solution to your Hamiltonian. So what we do is we use um, a quantum computer, possibly a small one, um, where all the qubits have gates acting on them uh, and the values or the operations of these gates are parameterized by some values that can change. In this case, they're sort of rotation angles given by these uh, theta values here. So what we do is we prepare a quantum state using this quantum computer and that's therefore the state is dependent on the values of these parameters. Using this quantum state, we measure our cost function by just measuring a Hamiltonian on it. And then we choose new values of the parameters to try and minimize this Hamiltonian. And so what we do is we sort of repeatedly do this in a, in a feedback loop where we use a quantum computer to calculate a variational state and then classical methods to choose new parameters, perhaps in just something as simple as a gradient descent scheme like I've shown here. So the idea is that we have access to a really large uh, sort of state space by parameterizing and using quantum circuits uh, that can hopefully try and find interesting uh, solutions to quite hard problems represented by large Hamiltonians. So uh, there's a number of sort of limitations to quantum computers and I think variational algorithms deal with them really well. In particular, because variational algorithms rely on some sort of gradient descent scheme or approximate optimization, during the operation of the algorithm, we can in fact have slight errors, slight imperfections in our states which then correspond to taking the wrong step within our optimization routine, but this can be corrected for in further optimization steps using just the gradient descent. And so in this way, variational quantum algorithms can tolerate actually relatively large errors, and you can often get away without needing error correction on your devices, so you can get away with very few qubits. So there's a huge, well, it's almost every day is the new archive papers coming out with applications for variational algorithms. Uh, I've listed what I think are some interesting ones and quite broad uh, themes here, uh, but I'll run through them quickly just to give you an idea of what they can be used for. Uh, the first one I have here, um, and well, was the original variational quantum algorithm is a so-called variational quantum eigensolver. And this is to solve and try and find ground states of molecules of, or yeah, ground states of complex molecules. So you can see how it's really nice where we're dealing with quant molecules, which are inherently quantum mechanical systems, to encode them into a Hilbert space made up of these qubits that also grows uh, exponentially, just like uh, the space of states in your, your quantum molecule. And so in this way, it's the Hamiltonian we have is physically just a Hamiltonian that represents the energy uh, value of a molecule that we want to try and optimize. Uh, some more or less physics-y applications of these, I think, I'd say, uh, are these three of the ones I've shown here. In particular, we've got uh, combinatorial optimization, this so-called quantum approximate optimization algorithm, which is basically solving a optimization problem that can be encoded into the structure of some sort of mathematical graph like we have here. So in this graph, you sort of describe some sort of satisfaction problem uh, in terms of these nodes and edges that uh, describe this graph. And you actually use your quantum algorithm to describe states that are then sort of approximate solutions to these and try and minimize uh, your mathematical problem that way. For those of you that are maybe familiar with machine learning and neural networks, you can already probably see the connection between uh, these parameterized quantum circuits where we're doing sort of a parameterized mapping that we're trying to learn with gradient descent and classical neural networks. And actually we can apply these ideas directly to both classical and quantum, um, yeah, input data to try and learn things about input data using this variational optimization method. Uh, in particular, there's a, a really nice paper here. I think uh, I'd really recommend it by Voiter, who was a, a student in Oxford a few years ago or last year, 
And I'd really recommend uh, taking a look at that for some quite exciting results there. Um, as well as that, I think the final thing I've got up here is actually some work that's been done uh, by some members of our group, and that's to solve um, partial differential equations on the quantum computer. So being able to recast, uh, yeah, basically solving quantum diff or sorry, partial differential equations as an optimization algorithm, you can then apply them to a quantum computer using a variational quantum algorithm. And in particular, they found quite a nice way of encoding non-linearities in this way uh, to solve non-linear partial differential equations when quantum mechanics is sort of usually restricted to being a linear theory. So I've sort of introduced here quite a few of the applications of uh, variational algorithms. And all of these applications and why we, we sort of look at these is to make use of the idea that we can access, well, this exponentially large Hilbert space that is exactly what Cameron spoke about in his talk, this sort of growing dimensionality when you start to represent uh, quantum systems. And that's what we can do exactly with these quantum computers. So when we're starting to look for what might make a good variational quantum algorithm, we basically need, or naively, we want to have a quantum circuit structure or a variational ansatz that can access all of Hilbert space really nicely with few parameters. Because if you're able to access all of Hilbert space, we're guaranteed to have um, or be able to represent states that are close to the true ground state of our optimization problem, and therefore able to represent the solutions that we need to our problem. A sort of a quick uh, demonstration of what this means to be an expressive ANSATS and access a lot of Hilbert space. So I've got this schematic just on the right hand side. And um, we see that for these one qubit circuits, so really simple, you can have an unexpressive ANSATS here where we have just a single rotation gate and therefore can access states, if you see on this block sphere, that just lie around the equator of the block sphere and we're really limited in what solutions we might be able to describe. Whereas this second circuit, where we introduce a second rotation gate around a different axis, you can see that we're able to, just with two gates, cover a huge amount of Hilbert space quite uniformly as well. And this means that when you use these sorts of ansatz, you're guaranteed to have good overlap with the sort of state that you want to find to describe the true solution of your problem. So it's all very well and good having an ansatz that can, in theory, represent the ground state of your problem, the solution that you want to find. Uh, but we need some guarantee or be able to actually get to find the parameters that leave you with that optimal solution, that optimal quantum state. And this is therefore leads on to the second thing uh, that you need in a good variation of quantum algorithm, and you need it to be basically trainable. And this means that when you have your uh, cost function landscape that uh, describes how our cost function varies as a function of the parameters in our circuit, we need the gradients within this to be uh, large enough so that we can do gradient descent through this uh, optimization landscape. So as an example here, we've got um, well two cost functions in this orange and this green surface. So you can see in the z-axis, we have a value of a cost function as a function of two variational parameters, theta one and theta two. Um, as an example of quite a good uh, cost function landscape and a good ansatz, we have this blue surface here, where you can see for pretty much the whole range of the parameters that we have here, uh, we have a large gradient in the surface, and we can therefore start to do gradient descent throughout this to find eventually the minimum at the bottom. In comparison, we have quite a poor ansatz or a poor cost function in this orange surface here, where although we get steep gradients in the center, right near our minimum, right for quite a lot of the values of these parameters, these outer edges, we have really, really flat cost function landscapes where the gradients are basically zero. And so this is what we mean in the, by the phrase a barren plateau. So just like in geographically, we have big flat areas where not much lives, not much interesting is going on. And if we try and optimize in these areas with these sorts of ansatz, we don't really get anywhere closer to our, our ground state solution. So really naively, when you design a variational quantum algorithm, you design your ansatz to be both expressible and trainable. But quite a recent result, uh, in fact, from just a, a month ago by Zoe Holmes and some other members of the Salamos group, um, showed some uh, constraints that actually showed us uh, that having high expressibility ansatz, being able to access all of your Hilbert space, basically guarantees that you end up with these barren plateaus as you increase the number of qubits in your algorithm. 
And so this means that if we have a, a really expressive ansatz, we're basically completely unscalable in the way we can apply this algorithm as we go to large system sizes. So the solution or one solution to this is to actually restrict ourselves, use an ansatz structure that is more restrictive and can't access as much of Hilbert space, this large state space as we first thought. To describe, uh, just give an idea of what I mean by this, um, I've got this diagram down the bottom where if we have our whole Hilbert space, the whole possible number of states that can be described in whatever dimension we're working in, um, given by the gray, and we can access quite a lot of it in the blue because we have a really expressive ansatz, we're guaranteed to get cost function landscapes that are really, really flat in some parts and have these barren plateaus. So instead, we must use an ansatz like this one that's shown up here, where we can access a much smaller amount of Hilbert space, um, which doesn't necessarily lead to barren plateaus, but still ensures that we contain our um, ground state solution, given by this green area here. And so importantly, when we limit ourselves in this sort of way to restricted ansatz, we may be able to describe the ground states of some um, problems that we might have, but not others. And this means that when we start looking at our ansatz, we need to design them in such a way that we use uh, specific knowledge about the problem that we're solving, whether it's the physical system or some other system, uh, to inform our choice of ansatz, to guarantee that we can access the true ground states um, but without having to be really, really expressive. And this is usually done uh, by making use of sort of symmetry or conservation requirements. So you can perhaps see a bit of a theme in the work that happens in our group between me and uh, Cameron, and that it's a lot of symmetry work in this sorts of thing to deal with these large dimensional spaces. So finally, if I've got a bit of time, I think I do, um, I'll give one example about how this is done for a sort of interesting physics problem solved with a variational quantum algorithm. In particular, uh, this is a paper that looks at the Fermi Hubbard model. And this is just basically a model that describes um, interacting fermions or electrons that exist in a lattice, like I guess similar to one Cameron spoke about before, where these electrons can hop between lattice sites and also repel each other if they're on the same lattice site. And in particular, this Hamiltonian is then made up of a hopping term that describes the effect or the energy contribution from electrons changing lattice site. And also the repulsion terms about um, yeah, electrons being on the same site repelling each other. So this is a, a really interesting physical model. It's investigated in loads of uh, different places. And despite being quite um, simple, it does describe a, a huge range of physical phenomena. And in particular, or one example is high temperature superconductivity. So in this paper, they actually use a variational circuit, the structure of their ansatz, that is based on these terms within the Hamiltonian. So in this case, the variational circuit they use has, um, well, variational terms that are made of exponentials of the on-site term, again, given by, well, parameterized by some parameter, in this case, these uh, new terms, and also gates that implement the exponential or the sort of time evolution of the hopping term uh, T here, again, parameterized by these tau parameters. And so by using these uh, terms within the Fermi Hubbard Hamiltonian, you basically encode whatever um, symmetries there are in your Hamiltonian into the states that you describe with your variational ansatz. And through some sort of clever um, uh, arguments, they can show that this is still able to represent the sort of ground states we want. Uh, it's not surprising, but by restricting ourselves to the relevant um, symmetry areas of our state space. Um, one subtlety is they actually add additional driving terms into their ansatz that don't commute with the terms in this Hamiltonian. And this actually helps us uh, leave this sort of symmetry, um, symmetry preserving uh, state space briefly and helps avoid sort of um, local minimum and things in our optimization length setting. So finally, uh, I, this is my final slide of the talk, uh, just some quick results from their paper. Um, and this shows how their ansatz that they propose here, the QOCA, performs much better than uh, a sort of what's called the hardware efficient ansatz. And this is an ansatz where you cram in as many parameters as possible into the shortest depth and make your circuit as expressive as possible, but without preserving any, any symmetries. So you can see how um, 
the one minus the fidelity. So this is the infidelity of our output state. Basically, the lower down on these graphs, the better. We can see that the QOCA ANSATs that does try and preserve these symmetries partially performs much better than harder efficient ANSATs in these green dashed lines. And so quickly, you can see a schematic of how that works and that this QOCA ANSATs approximately restricts itself to the, the sort of states in Hilbert space that can serve the number of particles or have a fixed number of particles equal to the number of particles in our solution. With harder efficient ANSATs, on the other hand, um, can explore all of Hilbert space, but necessarily doesn't restrict itself to these particles and can also suffer from barren plateaus. So I'll leave up a slide here for you to read yourselves as a summary. I just hope that I've given you a bit of an introduction to what variational quantum algorithms are, why they might be useful and what they can be used for. And also introduce this idea that there is this uh, trade-off between how expressive our circuit can be and also how trainable it is. And it's not as simple as uh, just maximizing the both. And we have to use uh, quite clever arguments in the way we design these things. Yeah. So yeah, hopefully I wasn't too long. And I guess time for any questions now. It was okay, yeah. Uh, so we have uh, two questions in Q&A session. Mm -hmm. And people, so one from Tyson Jones, who does like research on rational yeah. quantum algorithms himself, if I'm not mistaken. And so I, I'll probably read this aloud because uh, people can see this up until we answer. So mm -hmm. what statements can be made about the Hilbert subspace in which solutions to interesting problems, e.g. chemistry ground states, are expected in? Why should we think an expressive ansatz, an expressive ansatz yeah. uh, can produce states sufficiently close to that subspace? Um, that's a good, well, I think an expressive ansatz is defined um, as being close to, if you're at all familiar with this high unitary measure, which is necessarily um, the sort of uniform distribution over the whole of your possible unitary space. So if the idea is that by simp sampling randomly from an expressive ansatz, you're equally likely to get any possible state. Um, so this means that, of course, we necessarily have a non-zero or an equal or, yeah, a non-zero probability of sampling our relevant output states. But of course, we don't know uh, that's not particularly great. We'd rather sample more closely in the relevant, um, uh, yeah, sort of states that we have with the, the relevant symmetries. I don't know if that fully answers your, your question, Tyson, but I think it's sort of a necessarily um, result of just having, for example, an, uh, a maximally expressive ansatz that can implement this HAR measure on your, your state space at the end. Oh, wow. <laughs> <We're>... <laughs> okay, so- uh... Sorry, I, I, know, I know Tyson's very familiar with these things, I imagine, so. No, no, but we have like other questions like they're just like popping out uh, like straight here. So Tony H asks, uh, is QVA strongly related to the physical realization of quantum computer and how do you control answers? Sorry, is qubits what? Oh, you can see um... it in Q and A session. I think uh, so. oh, oh. I might, let's see, can I leave this? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I, yeah. No, I'm just having the inevitable. Uh, no, can you just read it out again, please, if that's all right? Uh, is QVA strongly related to the physical realization of quantum computer? Which means, and how do you control answers? Yes, so um, if I understand the, the, the question properly, it's, um, for example, the physical realization of our computer, whether it's, um, trapped iron or whatever, and also the connectivity which qubits can interact with each other are actually significant limitations in um, the sort of ansatz that we can prepare. So when you design these really expressive ansatz, these so-called hardware efficient ansatz, it's quite easy to tailor them to the sort of, um, well, the connectivity between your, your different qubits, which qubits can interact with each other, and also what gates can be easily performed or natively performed on these qubits. As you start to introduce these symmetries that are more restricted to your problem, um, that becomes a lot harder to do. And it might become, I think it's possibly likely that you start having different types of qubits, different types of quantum computers applied to different optimization problems or different types of problems. Uh, so we have two more questions. I think it'd be really bad if you uh, stop sharing the screen. Oh yeah, sorry. You can see the question because uh, it turns out I'm not really good in reading these questions aloud. Uh, yes, so I'll, I've seen Jan's question. So this is how do you know about narrowing down the Hilbert space 
uh, still contains uh, your target ground states. So this is a result when you use these sorts of Hamiltonian based ANSATs, uh, for example, this uh, one I showed here, and in my own work, I deal with ones you describing uh, coupled harmonic oscillators. Um, there's lots of results from um, an area of physics called optimal control theory or quantum optimal control theory. And this basically using different Hamiltonians, uh, evolving your state under that Hamiltonian for different amounts of time and in different ways, there are known arguments about what sorts of Hamiltonians can generate what sorts of um, states at the end, for example. So for, for the example I showed here, that um, it's known to, these ANSATs are known to produce whatever number of um, electrons you basically encode in the start, it's known to preserve that. But for my own work and for the QOCA ANSATs, for example, they're known to produce um, output states that are close to Gaussian states, for example. And so if your solution is encoded that way, you end up with, with nice states at the end. And Ian? Um, probably the last question. Yeah, yeah hi Ian. Uh, is there a relationship between the expressibility and trainability trade-off and Heisenberg uncertainty principle? Um, I think it's a question to physics and philosophy guys. Yes, I, so. I, I, I really thought about it that way. In uh, from what I've sort of thought about and what I've heard people say, it's rather than being the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, it's almost a result of just working in these large um, dimensional spaces and it's almost inevitable in that way. Uh, I don't know how the Heisenberg uncertainty principle might come into it there, but it's quite an interesting question. Yeah, okay, so thank you, Luis. Uh, we have one more question from Ayush, but uh, I think we'll be, well, could you please um, like, yeah. answer this? Right. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in written. And so thank you very much, Luis. Yeah, I think it was also a great intro, like uh, we're basic into quantum variation algorithms. And now it's time for Maria to step up and to tell us here about risk here research. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the talks so far. They've been really interesting, Cameron and Lewis. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about something a bit different. So um, in the next 15 minutes, time is going to move forwards. But what do we mean by time moving forwards? Today I'm going to start by explaining how people normally derive the irreversible arrow of time and why I think there's some important problems with this. Then I'm going to introduce a different way of looking at irreversibility and I'm going to give a model for this using quantum theory. And then at the end, I'm going to bring all these ideas together with a thought experiment where I'm going to explain how this new kind of irreversibility could be connected with the ultimate limits of erasing quantum information. So explaining the direction of time was a problem even for classical physics, even before we knew about quantum physics. And this is because the dynamical laws of classical mechanics are all reversible. So if every interaction between particles is reversible, then how do we get any irreversibility in the systems around us? The solution is normally given by the second law of thermodynamics, which is based on a physical entity called entropy, which is a measure of disorder. And I like to explain this using an egg. So an egg, begins as a yolk and a white. So let me just wipe my hands. Um, so the egg begins as a yolk and a white. We say that this is a low entropy, highly ordered state. And this is because there's only a few ways that these egg particles can be arranged for the egg to be separated into a yolk and a white. But if I beat the egg, then I'm increasing its entropy and it's becoming more and more disordered. This is because there's lots more ways that the particles in this egg can be arranged for it to be mixed together um, than the yolk and the white. So it's got higher entropy when it's mixed together. Now the second law of thermodynamics says that the entropy of an isolated system can't decrease. Well, 
it says that it's exceedingly unlikely to decrease. And you can see this with the egg because even if I keep beating this egg for the rest of my PhD continuously, it's exceedingly unlikely to ever go back to being a yolk and a white. So the second law that entropy is unlikely to decrease gives us a direction of time from order to disorder. But I think there's a couple of problems with this. Firstly, it's a statistical law. It only tells us what's likely or unlikely to happen. This contrasts with lots of our other laws of physics, like the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy, which is an exact, uh, which is an exact law and doesn't depend on probabilities. And secondly, the second law phrased this way is an approximation, and it only works for large systems like this egg. If the yolk and the white were only made of a handful of particles, then it wouldn't be unreasonable for them to separate again into the yolk and the white in the near future. So is there a second law of thermodynamics that works on the microscopic scale, or is the direction of time inherently an approximation? So now let me introduce a different way of looking at irreversibility. So we can define irreversibility in terms of whether a transformation is possible, um, a transformation of a system from one state to another state is possible or impossible. Now I'm going to define possibility as to mean that I can transform, um, that some entity can perform a transformation of a system from one state to another to arbitrary accuracy and it can carry on doing so over and over again. So let's call this entity a catalyst. Okay, so going back to the egg example, can anyone think of a catalyst to transform an egg from being a yolk and a white to being mixed together? If you can think of one, can you pop it in the chat? So um, if you can think of any entity we could use which could transform a yolk and a white to a mixed egg and could keep, could retain the ability to do that again. Um, I'll just wait a few seconds and see if any answers come into the chat. Oh, great. We have an answer from Harry, the beta yeast, um, which is exactly right. So my whisk is a catalyst for transforming my yolk and a white to the mixed egg. So now does anyone, um, now let's think about the reverse process. What if we want to transform the mixed egg back to a yolk and a white? Does anyone have any, um, any suggestions for a catalyst that can transform a mixed egg back to a yolk and a white? Can you pop it in the chat? Okay. There, was, there was an answer a bit before, like to feed it to chicken and you'll get another egg. Feed it to a chicken. Uh, yeah, I suppose there'll be some complex entropy changes going on there. Um, but overall, uh, the chicken isn't an isolated system. I think that's where the key is. The chicken is taking in order from its environment. Um, but it, it's a very nice suggestion. Um, we have a time machine or detergent. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the detergent idea refers to. Um, a time machine would be very useful, but I'm not sure we can currently go back in time without wormholes and negative energy and strange things. Um, okay, so as, as far as I know, we don't know of a catalyst that can transform a mixed egg back to a yolk and white. And so here we have a type of irreversibility where one transformation is possible and the reverse transformation is not possible, even though the dynamics of the egg being mixed are symmetric with time. And this type of irreversibility doesn't depend on probabilities. It's an exact statement. Okay, but can we use this kind of irreversibility on a quantum scale? Well, in my research, I've been looking at a model within quantum theory where you can transform, um, 
you can perform a transformation from one state to another and not necessarily perform the reverse transformation. Uh, well, the reverse transformation is not necessarily possible in the way I've defined possible, even with time reversal symmetric dynamics. So um, firstly, one important thing to note is that all the dynamical laws in quantum theory are also time reversal symmetric. So in quantum theory, we describe interactions um, by unitary matrices, if you're familiar with the formalism of quantum theory, and every unitary has an inverse that we can apply to reverse what happened. So everything, all the interactions in quantum theory are reversible. Okay, so to explain this um, model in quantum theory, I want to introduce some properties of qubits. So a qubit is our smallest unit of quantum information, and a qubit can be in a pure state. So a pure state is an undisturbed uh, state. Uh, a qubit can also be in a mixed state, which is like a noisy state. And so as a kind of rough analogy, I'm going to represent a pure state by my saturated egg and a mixed state by my mixed egg. Now, I've been researching a machine which can transform a qubit from any state to any other state. And it's called a quantum homogenizer. So let me explain how this works if, um, if I want to transform a mixed qubit to a pure qubit. So because I'm trying to get a pure qubit at the end, then what I do is I build a homogenizer made of lots of identical pure qubits. So here's my homogenizer. I'm representing my pure qubits by chocolate eggs. And um, I have lots of identical pure qubits in the homogenizer. So then what I do is I let one by one, I let each homogenizer qubit interact with my mixed qubit that I'm trying to transform. And I let them interact by a unitary interaction called a partial swap. So what happens when you do a partial swap is the mixed qubit becomes a bit more pure and each pure qubit becomes a bit more mixed. So what I do is I let my mixed qubit interact one by one with all my homogenizer qubits and then it gets more and more pure until it's been transformed to a pure qubit. But because each of my pure homogenizer qubits only interacted with my mixed qubit once, they're still very close to their original pure states. So the key question is, can I keep using this homogenizer to transform more mixed qubits into pure qubits? So in other words, is my quantum homogenizer a catalyst for the mixed to pure transformation? Now, according to my calculations, it's not. What happens is that when I try and reuse this homogenizer, it deteriorates too quickly for me to be able to use it over and over again. So, um, so the homogenizer is not a catalyst for the mixed to pure transformation. Okay, but what happens if we think about the reverse transformation? What if I want to use the homogenizer to transform a pure qubit to a mixed qubit? Well, then I make a homogenizer of mixed qubits, which I'm going to represent by these smarties. And I, as before, I let my each mixed qubit partial swap with my pure qubit one by one. And at the end, my pure qubit turns mixed. And it turns out that we can actually keep using this um, pure to mixed homogenizer as many times as we like as long as we make it big enough. So the quantum homogenizer is a catalyst for transforming a qubit from a pure state to a mixed state. So here we have the example of irreversibility for the quantum scale. The pure to mixed task is possible, but the mixed to pure task is not possible using the homogenizer. It might be possible using some catalyst we don't know of, but at least with the homogenizer, it can't be done. And so, um, so here we have our irreversibility. So this is nice because it's an exact statement. It's not dependent on probabilities. 
it works on um, different scales because we've shown a kind of model for this irreversibility at a quantum scale. And it's compatible with time reversal symmetric dynamics because all the interactions between the qubits were unitary, which means they were reversible. Okay, so, um, but I actually think there's something else that's interesting about this asymmetry between mixed states and pure states. And um, I'd like to ask, does, have any of you heard of the Maxwell's demon thought experiment? Can you raise your hand on uh, using, using the Zoom raise hand if, if you've heard of Maxwell's demon? Okay, we have quite a lot, the numbers grow. Um, yeah, it looks like we have nearly, nearly 20 have heard of it. Great. Um, well, it's one of my favorite thought experiments. I uh, think it's really cool. And today I'd like to summarize a, a modern version of the thought experiment, which is known as uh, Zillard's engine. And I'd like each of you to play the part of the demon in this thought experiment. Okay, so we start off with um, a particle, which is, I'm gonna represent by a chocolate egg, in a box. And the particle is randomly moving around in the box. And as the demon, your task is to observe which side of the box this particle is on. So um, you observe whether it's on the left or the right. And okay, let's say it ends up on, it should be your left. Um, Okay, so the particle's on the left. So now what you can do is uh, get a spring and attach it on the right of the box. And so as your particle collides with this spring, it's gonna push against the spring and compress it, okay? As it tries to expand into the box again. So when your spring compresses, that's gonna store some energy and you can then, um, use the energy later to do whatever you want, to do something useful. So it appears that we've managed to transform the random energy of the particle in the box to useful energy in the spring. And if this can happen, then um, we would violate the second law of thermodynamics because the entropy in our system would have gone down. Okay, but now I want to ask you another question. How many of you remember which side of the box the particle ended up on? Can you raise your hand if you remember um, whether the particle was on the left or the right of the box? Okay, we have quite a few. Um, at least 20 of you have a good memory, excellent. Um, so the key point here is that in order to know which side of the box to put the spring on, to extract the work, we had to store the information about which side of the box the particle was on in our memory. And if we try and keep doing this, um, keep running this engine over and over again, then at some point our memory is gonna be full and we're gonna to have to erase that information. And it's been shown that erasing information has a minimum entropy cost and that compensates for the decrease in entropy from the useful energy that we got earlier. So everything seems fine, okay? So now let's turn this, um, turn this thought experiment quantum. So to, uh, to understand the quantum version of Zillard's engine, we're going to model the particle in the box as a qubit and your memory as a qubit. So the particle in the box begins as a mixed qubit because it's randomly moving around and your memory begins pure. Then when you observe the qubit, um, the box qubit, then your memory becomes entangled with the particle and they're both correlated. Okay, and then after you've extracted your work, then your particle in the box is a mixed qubit again, but this time your memory is a mixed qubit as well. So if you want to keep running this quantum uh, engine, then you're going to have to transform your memory from a mixed state back to a pure state. But we said earlier that using the quantum homogenizer, you can't keep transforming 
a mixed state to a pure state in a cycle because your homogenizer will deteriorate when it's used lots of times. And so it seems like this irreversibility implies that there's an additional cost to erasing your memory from a mixed state to a pure state, in addition to the entropy cost we mentioned earlier. So this tells us that there might be something, um, something we didn't know about before, adding an extra cost to erasing memory in a quantum Zillard engine. Okay, so to summarize what we've, um, what we've found out in the last 15 minutes, uh, firstly, we talked about the direction of time being explained using the second law of thermodynamics, which says that entropy is highly unlikely to decrease. But this is a problem because it's, um, it's a statistical law. It only tells us probabilities, and it only applies for large scales like eggs. Then we introduced a different type of irreversibility in terms of a task being possible and the reverse task not being possible. And we went through a model of this in quantum theory by applying it to show that transforming a pure state to a mixed state is possible using a homogenizer, but transforming a mixed state to a pure state is not possible to do in a cycle with a homogenizer. And then, um, and then finally, we looked at a thought experiment where if you want to keep running a quantum engine in a cycle, you've got to keep erasing your memory from a mixed state to a pure state. So because of the irreversibility we talked about, that might be more difficult than we previously thought. So just to finish off, um, the physicist Edwin James once said that information and quantum mechanics and entropy were scrambled up into an omelette that needs unscrambling. And perhaps this different way of looking at irreversibility can help us unscramble some of that omelette and give us some new insights into quantum erasure along the way. Thanks, and I'm happy to take any questions. Jesus Christ, Maria, thank you very much. It was so entertaining, so hilarious. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I, I, I like, I, I'm really jealous. Like, to what, like, stop you doing? It sound, looks so foundational, like, like some miracles of the world. Yeah, we have uh, questions for you. Can you can you see them? I think uh, there's one in chat and one in Q and A session, at least. Okay. So, uh, so the one in the chat is, can you really say that the second law explains the arrow of time rather than just characterizing it? Um. Well, I guess. What the second law is trying to explain is the direction of time. So, um, so if you take a video and you watch the reverse video, then you see kind of differences. And um, I guess the question is, say the second law explains why there's those differences on a microscopic scale. And it's a bit more ambiguous whether we can tell whether the difference is on a microscopic scale. So that's where kind of trying to explain the microscopic second law would come in useful if you're trying to explain if watching a reversed video of the microscopic scale works within our laws of physics or not. Um, and rather than just characterizing it, um, well, I mean, I guess other theories of physics try to actually explain the nature of time, like um, things like Einstein's theories of relativity tell us interesting things about the nature of time, but the second law is specifically explaining the direction. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Um, the first one in the Q&A is, could you briefly outline how we prove that there is a lower bound on energy cost of erasing information? Okay, so, um, well, firstly, the lower bound is actually on entropy cost, which often, um, often manifests itself as kind of a heat cost, which is why often we kind of think of it as an energy cost, but it can just be kind of entropy, some other kind of disorder in the system that doesn't necessarily happen with energy. Um, the actual derivation of, so it's called Landauer's principle, this idea that resetting, that erasing information needs, um, that erasing information needs work to be put in. And the actual derivation actually depends on the second law being true. So it's kind of um, 
the principle is consistent with the second law and these thought experiments kind of are fully consistent as long as we have this Landau's principle dissipation in conjunction with the second law being true. But I, as far as I know, I think it's actually um, a bit controversial, like whether there's a way of deriving Landau's principle without not being dependent on the second law being true to do that. Um, okay, so the next question, apart from the second law of thermodynamics, are there any other systems we are able to use as an hour of time? Um, I mean, I think kind of there are various um, there are various ways people tried to um, characterize the arrow of time using kind of different quantities, like a cosmological arrow of time based on, I think, the expansion of the universe. Um, people talk about a psychological arrow of time. So I think there's different ways uh, you can kind of view it through different lenses and think of a certain quantity changing with the past and the future. Um, but I think the second law is the kind of most, I guess, um, I see as the most general way of thinking about trying to distinguish past and future, but there are lots of different approaches. Um, isn't time just mathematically um, a fine parameter? Um, I mean, I think in different theories of physics, time is different mathematically. So time in quantum theory, for example, is treated differently than it is in relativity, which is um, a bit of a problem. And I think this links uh, kind of to what I was saying before that the, the second law is trying to kind of um, trying to tell us about the direction rather than the nature of time itself, which is something um, something for other theories to tell us because if you kind of have a system that is entirely reversible and there's no arrow of time, you can still have time actually moving forwards and the system aging. You just can't tell. You just have no way of kind of saying what's forwards and what's backwards. And how do black holes follow the second law? Um, that's an interesting point. Uh, black holes, there's a kind of whole area, um, whole field of black hole thermodynamics where people basically kind of noticed this strange phenomenon that black holes seem to exactly parallel our laws of thermodynamics. You can have a second law for black holes, which is that the, um, the area of the black hole is a measure of its entropy, the surface area. And so, um, so there's various ideas about kind of what happens when you drop information into a black hole and then the area increases a bit and that shows that the entropy is increasing. So we have these um, these laws of thermodynamics for black holes and I think the fact that thermodynamics thermodynamic laws have kind of popped up in the black hole scenario is one of the motivations for thinking that the second law isn't just an approximate thing that appears on our microscopic scale and that there is something more fundamental about the second law. So that's actually one of the um, motivations for thinking that there might be some second law that works for different scales and is exact and fundamental. I think that's it. I think Jesus Christ, we never went so deep, you know, flash talks to like black holes and quantum formation and all the microscopic, microscopic scales. So thank you very much, Maria. Thanks. And I think this is, uh, I, I don't know, guys, can I say that like if anybody has any other questions, they can uh, reach out to you. Um, yeah, uh, what would be the best way to? Uh, well, you can get me on email. I'm just lewis.anderson at physics.ox.ac.uk. Um, yeah, I'm maria.vialoris um, at mag.ox.ac.uk. Oh, yeah, good chat, Lewis. I'm, I'm Cameron Booker at, at physics. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Right, Lewis, you send this message oh, only to like send it to the chat then you can work out how Zoom works. Yeah, I think that's that's your job to work out how to send it to everyone. Yeah. Um <laughs> yeah, however you want to get in touch. Feel free. Okay, so thanks to everybody who are listening to us this evening. I hope this is just the beginning like of a new and exciting term. Please uh, stay safe, just stay calm and the spring is coming, so everything will be a little more uh, smiley. 
next month. Yep. Bye bye. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for organizing, Alexi. I don't know where to thank Maria for organizing the whole society. <laughs>